Charlottesville Inside Out is made possible thanks in part to its patrons, committed to supporting the people, places, and quality of life that uniquely define Charlottesville and its surroundings, and by viewers like you. Thank you. It's got retractable gear, and it's got flaps right there for landing. My next move is to do a picture of Harriet Tubman with a pistol. For WHTJ, I'm Terry Allard, and this is Charlottesville Inside Out. Our guest today is an artist and a Charlottesville native. Inspired by a passion for history and people, he creates a variety of works that can be found in galleries, businesses, and private collections throughout the community and beyond. Join us as we talk with Frank Walker. Come on. Frank, talk about the focus of your art over the years and the mediums with which you prefer to work. Always has been my favorite is pencil just plain old pencil. Artists talk is graphite. But <laughs> just a plain old number two pencil is good enough for me. It's what I was always comfortable with growing up. A lot of times before I do a painting, uh, matter of fact, the ones you even see in here on wood were always drawn in pencil. And I adamantly believe in drawing because drawing is the gateway to all other things. I think art-wise, you should be able to draw. It's, it, it has uh, the ability to design it's the ideas that you come up with, and then from w whatever medium you want to use after that, you can. Yeah, even in the digital age, you, even you still really feel like people should be able to draw. Age. Yes, because, yeah. you know, I've gotten calls from people before who, who don't know how to do anything else but use a computer, and so they would call me and they said, listen, can you draw this because we can't find it in clip art? Yeah. Because you need to be able to design things sometimes from zero. Yeah. So well, let's talk about the very beginning, because you started drawing as a young child. Um, yes. What was it that was inspiring you to draw? Was it comics? I, you books? know, uh, honestly, uh, some people don't believe it, but kindergarten, mm -hmm. we got these workbooks. These, and some people will remember this as Tom and Betty workbooks. And so my, even my brother and I would mimic these workbooks. We would copy. Tom and Betty the dog, you know, yeah. on the workbook. And I remember my teacher telling me when we got this workbook, do not draw on this workbook. And that was the first thing I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> draw the workbook. Oh, and so oh it, that's it, great. It kind of went from there. And as we got older, comic books were a tremendous influence on us. And even in elementary school, we would go over to uh, Burley High School where my mother worked, and there was a man named Mr. Waldo Johnson, who was the art teacher there, who would always influence us to be creative with things. That yeah, we and you, there was a woman in the neighborhood, she had an art exhibit in the backyard, and you she, sold your art. We did, Mrs. Frances Brand, who we called the Purple Lady. Frances Brand wore purple everything, and uh, she gathered us together, my, uh, myself, Jerry Mitchell, my brother Bo, Earl Gordon, and we had a backyard art show with clothespins and clothespin them to the clothesline. And I think we made $25 out of that whole fiasco, which would have been considerably a lot yeah. of money. And so all of us, all four of us, went into the art business, either teaching or, or becoming artists or in, in some fashion. And your family has a lot of history here in the community. Absolutely. Talk about, just a little bit about your family. Absolutely. My family, uh, my mother's side of the family is from here. My grandfather built this house. My mother was a school teacher for many years. My dad was uh, an architect. My parents met at Hampton Institute. My father left uh, early. So uh, my mom raised us and my grandfather and, and, and three uncles. I'm thinking too about when you were growing up, the story that you told and about it when you were in high school and you, you, you painted a watercolor that you yeah. did you you didn't like and you threw it away. Yeah, this was in uh, this was actually was in the ninth grade, and uh, that was the assignment. 
was to paint a still life, which was a bunch of flowers in this pot. Uh -huh. And it was like a tin can, an old tin can, ketchup can. And so I painted this thing and just, you know, and I said, this is just ugly. And <laughs> <laughs> threw it in a trash can. And, and what so happened? Mrs. Hahn, who was my art teacher at the time, went, dug it out of the trash can, had it mounted and matted and framed, and sent it to the Virginia State Art Show. Mm -hmm. And it won first place. <laughs> That's funny. It was that's, see, that's place. great. What, but yeah. what a great lesson to learn then, oh, too. Oh, fantastic. And then fantastic. you headed off to VCU, and you what did, you studied art. I, what I, did you I study? I went to VCU. I studied uh, painting and printmaking. And my intention was to really become a bum and a vagabond. You know, I, I just wanted to paint and draw for you know, the rest of the life, my life. Yeah. From there, I, you know, I went in the Army and couldn't get a, an art job even though I had background in it and everything. And uh, I had drawn all these pictures of these uh, guns and things like that, and machine guns, and put them on uh, where I was. I'd tape them on the wall where I was working. And so this colonel came through and, and asked me, did I want a job? And so we were out knee deep in mud, and the next thing I knew, we were on a helicopter into a, a headquarters and learned how to do graphics. Yeah. And that led to doing work in military manuals, strip maps, it led to doing charts and graphs for uh, organizational readiness. I even designed a uh, 8th Infantry Division symbol. And then when you were back here, you, you worked at UVA for a long time and you were doing these in very detailed drawings that makes the view of the human body. It, like, explain explain it, what it you was, were working uh, in scientific illustration, it, it's called medical illustration. Now I'm not a, a certified medical illustrator, but I was just talented enough to know anatomy, physiology. The human body is not going to change for the next million yeah. years. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then, yeah. and then also, you are really passionate about history. And you've done uh, that for decades. I've done that since childhood as well. I've always been fascinated by that. Uh, I had my uncles and my father served in World War II. Mm -hmm. So I always became interested in the, uh, uh, the history of World War II. It's probably one of my favorite parts of history. And history really influences, to, to this day, what you do with your art. Talk a little bit about that. It, it does. We, I've, I, I've done shows of people from Jefferson School who actually served in the military. And, and I have pictures of them when they're very young. So you, the people come and stare at them all the time. And they say, who is that? <laughs> because people look much different at 18 than they did at you know, 50, yeah. 60 years old. Yeah. But there's, there are people that we don't realize used to drive in the Red Ball Express. And then people don't know what the Red Ball Express was. It was a trucking outfit. And it was a predominantly black trucking outfit. And they used to move supplies all over Europe. They went in on D-Day. They were instrumental in getting mm. supplies to the front in the Battle of the Bulge. And realizing that an army moves on its stomach. It has to have food. Right. It has to have ammunition. Right. And so these are the men who braved mortar fire, machine gun fire, to get this, these uh, gasoline to where it had to be. Let's talk about some of the different exhibits you've had over the years. You've, had, you've done a lot of work with portraits. I enjoy doing people. And the strange part is, the more I know the person, if I know the person personally, it kind of turns out better because you, you know the character of that yeah. person. I have one, two, three portraits hanging at the university. I have two that I've done for the city. I even repainted Mr. Burley for Jackson P. Burley. Probably would range in the thousands of portraits that I've done and given it. And some I've given away and some of them I've done for. And you for had money. an exhibit at the Jefferson School. Yes. Talk about that. I, I call it things like. Uh, Buffoonism, because they, uh, they used to take African Americans and, and make these advertisements or make fun of them in these commercials. Mm -hmm. And in the cheating at cards, you're, the two characters on the end, and you'll see one man passing a card mm -hmm. between his toes to, uh, to another man that cheating. And so I built these table legs out of stairwell banisters and just a piece of wood. And I found in that scale these small cards and play money and and put that all in the piece, playing card. So that is such, that's such a variety of art. I mean, you, you, you have art that you paint on paper bags? Yes. 
you have art that you just that you sketch. You have talk about the yeah. piece behind you. I drew this face on that piece of gray board, and I said, "Well, there's something missing in it." And so I'm ready, reading about African American people being the throwaway people that you just ball them up in a piece of paper and, and throw them away. So many things have happened to people that, uh, uh, especially females, have just been misrepresented, mistreated. So I took this handkerchief and placed it on a board so that, and wet it and crumpled it up so that it would have some wrinkles in it and then proceeded to incorporate that into that yeah. woman's face and was to be thrown away. Well, so you're inspired by history. You're inspired by what you read and the people around you. What is your process? I mean, do you, do you paint or draw every day? Every day. Every, every day. day. I don't think there's a day that goes by that I don't doodle something. You know, practice, practice, practice. You don't do anything well unless you practice. You have to practice it. Whatever your passion is, right. you practice it. So what are you practicing on now? What is it, where are you headed now? I, I saw a very recent um, self-portrait. I did, uh, because I sold my other one. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to do another one, like going full circle. Now I'm into the, the mode where, this is what I've always wanted to do as a child, because here I am, that's all I do is artwork. Yeah. You know, so now this is my, this is my time. So um, I think forever in a day, you'll always be an apprentice because there's, there's always something you learn every day. And I believe everybody you ever meet in your life as a teacher, you always meet, you yeah. always learn something from somebody, uh -huh. good, bad, or indifferent. And so this is what, that is the reason that I draw all the time. I consider it work, but, you know, very enjoyable. Oh, you said and it I don't brings know that you peace. It I brings you total you peace. I, I don't know of many people that really sit down at what they do and totally enjoy it. Yeah. So you create things. I believe artists, uh, including myself, all creative people, look at things in a different dimension. We're not crazy. I think everybody else is crazy because they can't see what we see. <laughs> Well, so speaking of seeing what you see, where have people seen your art? Where do people find it, and how far away is your art? How well, far I, it I have some of it on Facebook, so it's, it's been all over cyberspace. But I know it's as far as South Dakota, California, Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana. And you've been at McGuffey, you've been at, at Jefferson City Cajero Center. Cajero Gallery when I was in school. Yeah. yeah. So what are you going to do next? It's always to me, to make African-American women look very strong. My mother was a very strong woman. She raised two sons. She had to be. So, but, but that was just her way. So as we went on in life, going our different ways, it was a matter of, uh, I think, uh, uh, discipline that was given to us by her. And now it's your job to create art. And to create all art. All time. And on Wednesday, I still take the trash out. <laughs> Frank, thank you so much for Absolutely. joining us today. Absolutely. I can't, can't wait to see what you do next. Absolutely. Always keep your eyes on the airplane. Okay. We want to keep the airplane in front of us. We never want to let it get behind us. Okay. Joe will take over if, it's, if, if we get it that way. But that's a big no-no. Spinning propellers can do a lot of damage. Today we're going to explore a hobby that's not only fun, but also teaches you about aerodynamics, wind and weather, electronics, robotics, and more. Join us as we visit the Rivano Radio Control Club. Come on. We want to be entertained. How entertained? <laughs> Hayward, who can join the club? Anyone's willing to follow the rules and be safe like you did today. And be safe. So talk about the rules and, and the importance of these rules in, in flying. Well, we don't want to hurt anybody. No. Yeah, <laughs> or anybody's property. And we're very careful about that. And uh, you're aware of uh, all kinds of things going on around the world, people flying models in places they shouldn't. That's not us. No. We have a very uh, stern and complete set of rules nationally with the Academy of Model Aeronautics and with our club members as well that govern safety and sound emissions and things like that. Uh, we're not allowed to fly over other people. We're not allowed to fly more than a certain distance or out of sight. We're very careful about that. We have patterns we fly so you know where to look in the sky. 
and we check people out. Yeah, and you fly at Milton Field. Talk about Milton Field. Milton Field's a treasure. Uh, it was part of Mr. Jefferson's uh, plantation at Monticello at one time. He did some wonderful experiments in uh, water-powered sawmills and things there on that property. Uh, it was used uh, as a farm all the way until 1939. The University of Virginia bought it and they started a flying school which was taken over by the Navy and the Army and they did a lot of training of pilots for World War II there. Mm -hmm. and I flew full size in there until 69. Oh wow. And in 72 the club has, uh, the, the Model Aviation Club, Ravana, has uh, maintained and run the field since and the university still owns it and they are very cooperative and uh, we have a good relationship with them. We actually help sometimes some of their people out there. They use it for uh, aeronautical engineering, uh, the SALT II treaty uh, air sensors out there, all kinds of things go on more and more now uh, of the university related things. So uh, it's a great relationship we have with the university at this point. So we're here today with Who's Flying, the RC plane club at UVA to observe some of the planes, see what the construction's like so we could get tips on constructing our own plane, and then also get some of our members exposed to how to fly, because right now we don't have a pilot. Hopefully it turns out better than last year. We ended in a crash, but yeah. that last is year, not the hope of this year. Last year we did crash our plane right before competition, so we didn't get to go. So this is kind of like a redemption year for us. Control uh, and focus is the most important part of flying. Uh, I lost my first apprentice lost control and it flew off out of sight and uh, never to be seen again. Actually, I've never flown the planes. It was a very difficult skill for me to learn. So I ended up going the drone route because for me it's much easier to fly and I have more fun doing it. My son is the airplane pilot, so I let him do all that. Talk about the benefits of being a member of this club. It's what I do to stay, have a balance in life so I can uh, be together with friends with a common idea of uh, things we enjoy and be outside, uh, have the use of Milton Field. Uh, we teach each other, we learn things. The youngest club member is about how old? 12 uh, or 14? Yeah, probably 12. And, and the and oldest is probably how old? We have several in the 90s. That's uh, that's, they are not necessarily active, but they still on the rolls. It's a great retirement hobby. Uh, and as I say, it gives you a way to get outside with, with a bunch of friends. Yeah. Um, all the things that make airplanes fly are how the world works, you know, it's, it's physics. Well, and what's great, I think, is that you don't have to know any of this to become a member. You don't even have, you don't have to know how to fly. You all teach members we will, how to fly. We will provide an instructor. We will provide a training aircraft. Uh, there is no cost to that. You must join the Academy of Model Aeronautics because that's where our umbrella insurance comes right. from. Right. And you must uh, eventually join the club, but you don't want you have to do that in order to go out and fly, as you found out this morning. Yeah. Uh, there's also a kind of an important thing is these planes of mine that you're seeing here are uh -huh. kind of unusual. You don't have to be this deep in the hobby. You can get into it as deeply as you want. You can go buy a plane off the shelf. Right. Like this one. Right. You can buy this off the shelf and fly it, you know, as soon as you've charged the battery. Uh, or you can spend quite a long time doing what I do over here, which is d actually design planes and make the original drawings and actually build directly on the plan. And what about the weather? It seems like perfect weather to me. Doesn't get better than this. Very little wind, the wind sock over there is hanging, drooping. It's from the right direction that we like. Clear sky. Instead of just the controller, you actually have a physical object that you not only need to learn how to carefully use, but take care of, maintenance, uh, and really just make sure that you know how to operate it carefully. If you're going on a hike and you're standing at the edge of a cliff and you're looking out into the valley, well, you can take a drone with you and fly it out in front of you and you get a view of you standing on the edge of the cliff that you could never get otherwise if you didn't have it with you. So it allows you to see different perspective of what you're seeing around you at any given time. So it's pretty cool. It was the best experience here today. Uh, flying a plane, it's sort of my first time. It was just fun being in the air. It was amazing today. 
aside from a plane, what else do you need to fly? Uh, I see what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, you need a radio system. Okay. And radio systems can be fancy or simple. Uh, I have radio systems here that probably cost 30 some bucks. And they run on batteries. They do. Uh, okay. This is a very uh, recent uh, innovation. And this one is uh, capable of flying uh, 250 planes. So and it will play. And it will play music. You can program. It will. <laughs> Whether we really want to do that or not. It or will play the Eagles. <laughs> it will play the Eagles or anything you want it to. So. But uh, I can demonstrate if you. Oh, that'd be great. You want. Yeah, this that'd be this great. is a Ferry Fulmer 1940 fleet defense fighter. I designed it right there on that table. It's a, this fuselage is, is completely scale. And uh, this is the aileron that makes it bank. That was bank right, that bank left. Uh -huh. this, uh, this is nose up, <laughs> nose down, and the, and the rudder, which uh, is to contract adverse yaw. And uh, so these, these all are exactly the way a full-size plane flies. This, this is a real plane. It just doesn't have a person on it. So. Oh my goodness. I'm gonna reach over and turn that off just for safety reasons. So you've been fascinated with planes. <laughs> safety I mean. first. But you've been fascinated with planes since you were young. And so you've, just tell us really quickly about a handful of the planes that you've designed from scratch. We've talked about that. What is this? This, this is a caribou. It, it was a plane that was ordered by the U.S. Army, uh, designed by de Havilland in Canada, and it was deployed to Vietnam. And Each of the, my planes is a specific airplane. Right. Yeah. And you have another one, you have another one that's almost like a, it's almost like a museum piece. Describe that one. That is a uh, SE-5A. It's the frontline fighter for the RAF in 1919 at the end of World War I. That's one of my best efforts. Yeah, yeah, it's gorgeous. And then you have you have another plane that's a duplicate of a plane that you used to own and fly. I have a number of those. There's one especially. It's a third scale, and the other one uh, that's a J3 Cub. Uh, it's a one third scale of one I used to fly into Milton Field back in the day. Just keep your eye on the airplane. If you see the nose dropping and the airplane going down. Just pull the nose back up a pull little bit. Pull the nose back. So it's pull and pull, push. Pull and push. Okay. If you want to turn to the left, just move the stick to the left a little bit. Okay. Okay, now watch it. If you hold it to the left long enough, it'll just keep rolling and rolling oh. and rolling. So when it's rolled enough, you're making a gentle turn, just let it come back. I think that it's really great uh, for people young and old to come out here to learn uh, and to uh, show off a little bit. <laughs> Being able to fly in all all the space in the air is kind of freeing. Our plane is normally like a 14 foot wingspan. And this year we're trying to carry like about 50 pounds of payload. So to me, it's just really interesting that you can engineer planes and then design them in a way where you can get like 50 pounds of weight to kind of soar through the sky and move and be aerodynamic. I'm rebuilding a plane for a friend. And this is the motor that came off of it. It's never been flown actually, but uh, I haven't used this. This is an internal combustion motor. It's one of those loud things that people sometimes complain about with our hobby. Right. Uh, but uh, this plane is 90 uh, inch wingspan and it's a Cub. And I, I, I'm removing this and replacing it with this. That is the equivalent power, but it's other than the little sound of the propeller going through the air, it's almost entirely silent. Right, so this is electric, and this is where a lot of radio control club members are going these days. Most people, right? Ninety-five or more percent of our flights this summer have been with electric power, right. which basically I brought to this club 14 years ago. Wow. Uh, I worked with electric flight uh, in retirement uh, with a company uh, to develop this kind of thing. And so that's where all this stuff came from. Well, and every year in the fall, you all have an annual event. The Don Reed. Yes, and yeah. people come, members come, members yep. from other clubs come. Neighbors come. Neighbors come, the community comes. Yeah. Describe that scene and describe, I mean, the variety of planes. You're gonna have something like this, but then you're gonna have some of these little teeny, just basic planes. Well, absolutely so. Uh, You'll see the multi-rotors flying. You'll see helicopters flying. Uh, you'll see a lot of fixed wing. Uh, you'll see a lot of people. Uh, it's a nice event 
a nice outing for people. And um, of course, anybody in the community is welcome to come. Oh, this is great. Hayward, thank you so much. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> you may not have the money to fly a real plane or the experience, but you can still get some of these little models and really take to the skies. And uh, I think it's really entertaining. It just feels amazing because, you know, you're looking up, you're standing in weather, and it's really nice out today. It's fun flying a plane. Okay, it's I'm going plane. up. Oh, 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 okay. come back down. Oh, okay, you oh. got it. You guys, go I'm going to, where's it going? Wherever you ah, want it to. I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> yeah. I'm going in circles. Yeah, okay. This is very like me. Roll to the left. <laughs> Roll left. Ooh, oh, hey, 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 I'm doing flips. Aerobatics. Yeah. Yeah. Aerobatics on the first lesson. I'm going to need a <laughs> little good. more time with this. That was perfect. <laughs> really? You like those flips, yeah. did you? That's it for this week for WHTJ. I'm Terry Allard. Join us next time on Charlottesville Inside Out. Charlottesville Inside Out is made possible thanks in part to its patrons, committed to supporting the people, places, and quality of life that uniquely define Charlottesville and its surroundings, and by viewers like you. Thank you.